everybody. Uh, I'm excited about this panel that we've uh, put together. Uh, so I wanted to say a little bit about how the panel came together and to introduce our four speakers who will then each tell us a little bit about their current and ongoing research uh, connected to, the, to space and outer space. Uh, so one of the sponsors of the conference is ASU's Interplanetary Initiative who helped us uh, sponsor sort of the online streaming component for those of you who are watching live or also uh, uh, asynchronously later in the future. Um, and so the panel came about in conversations we had with um, Lance and others at the Interplanetary Initiative about uh, sort of common interests and because uh, Mary Jane Rubenstein will be our keynote speaker later. So uh, in conversations, we discussed how the past decade has seen a renewal of terrestrial uh, energies aimed at space exploration and extraplanetary technologies. These trends uh, provoke questions about the ethics of colonization, extraterrestrial encounter, resource investment, and implications for human self-understanding. And as such, artists and humanists uh, are very important interlocutors in the so-called new space race. Arizona State University is a key site of interdisciplinary exchange about these issues, uh, especially in and through the, the work of the Interplanetary Initiative, where artists, humanists, and social scientists are in, in sustained dialogue with astrophysicists and engineers. The Interplanetary Initiative is a catalytic group that is helping connect, stimulate, and advance the scholarship on space, space exploration, and extraplanetary biology. Uh, this panel is assembled to showcase some of the cutting edge research and teaching uh, of ASU scholars uh, related to these topics. So I will introduce our four speakers in the order uh, they'll present, and we'll each hear from them for like maybe eight to 10 minutes with some time for um, panel cross conversation, and then we'll open up for audience Q&A. So Lance Garavi is uh, third here on the stage. Uh, he's an associate professor in the School of Film, Dance, and Theater. He's the associate director of the Interplanetary Initiative at ASU and an affiliated faculty member in the School of Earth and Space Exploration. Professor Garavi's uh, research focuses on experimental theater and performance, digital performance, religion and, uh, religion and performance, critical theory, and the intersections of science and art. Garavi's scholarship and performance has been published around the world and in several languages in journals including theater topics, modern drama, text and performance quarterly, ecumenica, the, uh, the Journal of Dramatic Theory and Criticism, uh, and Performance Matters. He recently completed work with a team uh, of artists and physicists about a project on a project uh, about Earth's deep interior called Beneath, and is currently working on projects about robots and the future of humans in space. Uh, Julian Ahn, uh, second on the stage here, is Associate Professor of Photography in the School of Art and a Senior Sustainability Scholar uh, in the Global Futures Laboratory here at Arizona State. Her projects, informed by background in geology and ecology, often explore material, culture, body-land relations, and uh, issues of interdependency and boundary. With uh, on a longtime collaborator, Damon Sauer, uh, her Ground Truth Corona Landmarks projects about uh, the remains of Cold War satellite calibration targets in the Sonoran Desert has been featured in a variety of places, including Wired Magazine, Hyperallergenic, Places Journal, and National Geographic. Uh, Elena Rochi, at the end of the table, is a clinical associate professor in ASU's design school, having previously taught at the Instituto Europa di Design, uh, di design uh, and the architectural school at SRUIC in Barcelona. She's affiliated not only with ASU's Interplanetary Initiative, but also with the Sydney Poitiers uh, uh, New American Film School and the Biomimicry Center. She's a former fellow at Taliesin, uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture, and was awarded the American Institute of Architects 2020 Educator of the Year Award uh, for the Arizona chapter. And immediately next to me is Granville Carroll, uh, an, a visual artist, educator, and Afrofuturist working with digital technology, poetry, and alternative processes to reshape the world. Carroll earned his BFA in photography from Arizona State University and has an MFA in photography and related media from the Rochester Institute of Technology. His work has been shown in the United States and internationally. He teaches photo digital photography here at ASU's School of Art, uh, where his work explores and expands ideas around racial blackness to, to encompass spatial blackness, temporal blackness, and spiritual blackness. So uh, first, join me in welcoming everybody, and then we'll invite Lance uh, to speak. So thanks. Thank you, Evan. I was recently reminded that I needed to update my ASU bio. 
uh, uh, I didn't do that in time. Uh, I, no, it's okay. I'm a, I'm a full professor now. Oh, anyway. Congratulations. No, thanks. We'll have drinks afterwards. Um, uh, so I hope the, uh, my panelists will forgive me I'm, uh, if I go off, off script. I'm, I'm not feeling myself. I, I just recently saw a balloon outside and had a panic attack. No, that didn't land. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, that's the joke. That's the joke. Uh, anyway, so do you know uh, what the first food and drink ever consumed on the moon was? Uh, so, no, it wasn't Tang, but that's a really good guess. Uh, in, in June of, of 1969, on board the Apollo 11 lander, NASA astronaut Buzz Aldrin, uh, he pulled out a, a small vial of wine and some bread, and just before he took that first step onto the lunar surface, he took communion. So uh, sacred space, cosmic uh, uh, religion and cosmic exploration is a pilot project of ASU's interplanetary initiative, and Evan spoke a little bit about that. It's a pan-university effort to imagine, design, and build the future of humans in space. And sacred space is an attempt to stimulate some thought and discussion uh, on the intersection of religion and space exploration. And I and my co-lead, uh, Mary Jane Rubenstein, uh, are, uh, uh, who happens to be giving a keynote shortly after this, please attend, um, are uh, moderating a series of webinars in March and April of this spring, engaging a set of scientists, historians, religious leaders, and scholars in exploring the past, present, and future of this relationship between religion and space exploration. And it's not just a bunch of, that, that relationship, it's not just a bunch of easy uh, anecdotes like the one about, about Buzz Aldrin. It's far more intimate and surprising and fascinating than even that, you know, brief anecdote would suggest. So um, we're holding a series of four webinars. The, the first one on March 2nd uh, around the question, how has religion influenced space exploration? And for that, we have two, two we're going to be talking to two folks, um, uh, both of them are historians, Roger Lanius, who's a former NASA chief historian, and Victoria Smolkin, who's an historian of the Russian space program. Uh, then on March 16th, we have a webinar on the question, how do our religious traditions teach us to conduct ourselves in space? Uh, and for that, we have several guests, Zara uh, Ayubi, who is a uh, professor of religious studies uh, focusing on Islamic ethics, Ingrid Lefleur, uh, 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 expert on Afrofuturism, Rabbi Daniel Ruttenberg, um, uh, an author and scholar in residence of the National Council of Jewish Women, and Deandra Smiles, assistant professor of critical indigenous geographies. Uh, really looking forward to that one, uh, or all of these really. Um, on March 23rd, we have, uh, we're going to address the question, how will space exploration reshape religion? And our guests are uh, Brother Guy Consomagno, who is the director of the Vatican Observatory, and Jeffrey Kripal, um, who is the uh, J. Newton Razor Chair of Philosophy and Religious Thought at Rice University. And then finally, rounding this out, we're asking the, you know, small-scale question, what is the cosmic future of humanity? Um, and for that conversation, our guests are Paul Davies, who's the director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science, right here at ASU, a very famous uh, cosmologist, and Catherine Keller, the George T. Cobb Professor of Constructive Theology at Drew University. Um, I can talk later about why we're doing this and what our hopes are for it, but I wanted to introduce you to this project uh, that's coming up frighteningly fast, MJ, um, uh, in, in March and April. And I, I, I hope you'll check it out and encourage your, your networks to do the same.
everybody. I'm Julia Nand. I'm really pleased to be able to walk through some images with you today. Um, so you'll notice there are two names above. So I'm actually a collaborator. I've been working with Damon Sauer for 20 years, almost 20 years. Um, I'm going to be showing two project examples um, that relate to technology on a changing planet, both dealing with space artifacts and the Earth's atmosphere. The first project is called Ground Truth which is a term used in remote sensing. The Ground Truth series is art, science, and history. The images are aesthetic artifacts, data maps, and documents simultaneously. Um, so I'm showing you kind of a case study. The images are a large series. It's a typology. So I'm applying the same kind of process to multiple sites. And this one shows the elements particularly clearly. So on the ground, you see a concrete cross that's 60 feet in diameter. That's a, a one amongst a grid of Cold War satellite calibration targets located near Casa Grande, Arizona, which is between Phoenix and Tucson, if you're not from here. And into the skies, we're mapping every contemporary satellite present but invisible at the moment of photographing using a satellite tracking application. We're using, we've created a map of the grid and have, in some cases, found only the most subtle remains. In this case, just the very center of the target was left, but we were able to measure away from the center and make the image anyway. We have different conventions for the color and opacity of the satellite paths. In this case, we use gray lines on the overcast skies. And in this detail, which might be hard to read, um, can't quite see from where I am, but you can perhaps make out that there are dots and also some text. So the dots are the locations of the satellites at the moment of photographing, and then the text is the name of each satellite. At the scale of the prints, you can actually, um, you can read the names of the satellites, which sometimes hint at the country of origin, like Brazil sat, for example, or the purpose, like GPS. And sometimes they're just, they're simply poetic, like Echo Star. Markers at elevation that we've, a few markers at elevation we found are made of rock with concrete edges, likely to, we hypothesize that it was because they wanted to save the, the weight, the labor of carrying the weight of the material uphill. But at, I'm really interested in the way that these rock signs meant to be seen from above remind me of symbols made by earlier cultures. And um, we feel we're kind of embarking on a, a photographic contemporary archaeology. So at its most basic level, ground truth tells the story of vast networks of information that connect us and the proliferation of technology encircling the globe. The second project I want to share with you is uh, very, very new in progress. The working title is Echoes of the Passage. Um, and these will be 30 by 30 inch square images. It looks like a rectangle because of the screen, but there'll be uh, circles floating in square black voids. Uh, we're working with curators to gain access to national repositories, including the Space Center Houston and the Kennedy Space Center, to photograph the surfaces of objects that have burned through the Earth's atmosphere. So you're looking at the heat ablation shield of Apollo 17, the last mission to the moon. We're using a visual treatment that draws attention to the act of observation, as if looking through a microscope or a telescope. I have several here of a Falcon 9 rocket body. And sometimes the images floating in the black void remind of celestial bodies themselves. more from the Falcon 9 rocket bodies. This one is the Gemini 5 capsule heat ablation shield, which reminds me of the orb of the human eye and its fovea. I'm interested in the power of the artifacts that have, that have these embodied experiences, withstanding temperatures about hot, half as hot as the sun, now back on Earth, giving, giving us contact in some strange way with those powers. I'm interested in the possibility of these space artifacts carrying a kind of charge. 
This is the Apollo 14 heat ablation shield. And a detail from the Cargo Dragon capsule, which was the first spacecraft to deliver cargo to the International Space Station. I have several from the Space Shuttle Atlantis. This is from its leading edge, its nose. And the engine. Burn marks on the silica tiles. And then this is a detail from the tires, which is a bit of an outlier. It didn't burn through the Earth's atmosphere, but it did kiss the Earth upon return and experience those pressures, which is another palpable sense of contact. Lastly, I have two images from the Mercury 9 capsule, which astronauts said so, was so small, you don't get in, you put it on. Um, Simply by lighting the artifact in a certain way, we opened up a new, new research questions for the curator. She'd never noticed, for example, the color turquoise in this, in this image or this surface crack. So sometimes artists literally shining a light on a subject open new questions. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So, Elena. Can you move there? Sure. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Clinical Associate Professor Elena Rocchi, um, Italian architect, and uh, now in Arizona uh, since uh, 2013. I teach architecture and uh, I am the head of architecture undergraduate program in the design school. And I have had always a fascination with uh, the space. What we teach architects mainly is about space and uh, I started in uh, first year um, course, studio courses to teach about thinking in space by imaging space. So students normally start to design inside the space of the page and then they move to the space of the space. Um, as I became the head of a program, I started to think that I could dream bigger and so um, very much inspired by interplanetary initiative and people like Lance Garavi uh, that I met a few years ago white teaching. Um, I proposed the um, Space Strategy Committee, uh, which I'm part now of, to develop a new research center um, that cuts across architecture and space and extreme environments and to call it ARCSA, the Arizona Research Center for Space Architecture. And to actually plug it into an existing structure at ASU that actually moves among two opposites. Um, something very ancestral that is represented by Roden Crater here and James Durrell and something completely futuristic like all the initiative, the new space initiative that we are developing at ASU. Uh, the dream is to have the architects um, being part of the bigger conversation. I've noticed that Every time we were trying to design images of the future architects were never um, involved because I think that we all look very difficult uh, as the matter that we are treating. And I am envisioning together with a team of people to actually use the ARCSA, the center, the research center uh, following our mission to put humans at the center of the space exploration, to propose probably solutions to build in the most standardized way, avoiding colonization, but talking of inhabitation, and always to do it by limiting the um, amount of space of inhabitation and the use of resources. And the reason was why 
we came out with this idea and I started to speak with Jessica Rousset, um, the director of the Interplanetary Initiative, was because there is something happening exclusively here at ASU that is thinking about the interplanetary future. Um, it's an, an incredible momentum for us, the architects, because many war agencies are planning to go to the moon and to Mars. And the third reason is because I strongly believe that the work of the future is space architecture for us, the architects. So we've launched our first studio a semester ago with Guy Trotti, a space architect, and Deva Newman, um, the director of the MIT Media Lab. And actually, students revealed that have, because of their background in architecture, they can actually think um, again about Earth architecture um, beyond just because of thinking in uh, space architecture. We have a research question um, fundamental to, to probably develop. And the first step we're going to make is to, to actually launch this fall a master in extreme environments and space architecture, um, touching upon biomimicry as well. But our research question is um, around determining what the roles of architects are on Earth and how these roles will be transformed uh, in space. Um, we believe, and I believe honestly, that we will be aliens. And uh, we will be, as Juliana Bruno, the scholar Juliana Bruno is putting it, we will be replicants when we will arrive on the moon, just because we are arriving already with database more than physical things. You know, we will arrive probably with uh, much faster because of augmented reality, because of immersive reality. So the question that probably some of the students will face in, in both the research center and in the master um, is to design with this fundamental question, are we human still? Juliana Bruno, in an article that is titled Storage Space, published in a phenomenal book titled Superhumanity, Design of the Self, published in 2018. To answer the question of how we're human, uh, simulated to ask a replicant from Blade Runner, Ridley Scott, 1982, to ask a better design android, much better, less monstrous, less caricatural than any Frankenstein or the android of Metropolis by Fritz Lang. And uh, I'm always thinking about, are we designing for human or for the replicants? Because the amount of space we're going to deal with will be much reduced. We will have issues of readapting, for example, things like religion to s more sunsets, less sunrises, questions of upright positions, lack of northeast. Transporting all this knowledge out of space means to re-question how that those rituals that we established because of our context here are going to be reconfigurated because the context is going to be different. But architecture that was so fundamental in the beginning of our humanity as the medium for allowing the body to be this relational in betweenness. We, the architects, I believe, um, can you know make sure that we address the human aspect of whatever we are doing in a less engineeristic way, but always looking at the in data. And so in the center, I, I think that we will explore the connection, the intersection, interaction, and the transformation between the corpora and the data. That will still produce the cultural 
um, core of the self, even out there. In the end, uh, Giuliano Bruno put it, we are all replicants equipped with digital memory. So what are, what is, you know, what is going to be designed according now to digital memories or which is, you know, we were part of a convening um, symposium a few weeks ago or a week ago and uh, we came out with the project of creating a digital archive of everything we know, as Bookmister fully would put it, in order, before forgetting it in a data store, like to actually transform it. There was a moment back in time that design actually helped us to find a way to belong. Uh, to this planet. Design, and I'm intending art, architecture, representation, but there was a moment in time when we discover, as primordial hominids, that we were able to convert our body into the dream of our body. And how we did, did we do that? Without language, but representation through painting and the makeup. Design is always, and therefore architecture, is always abstracted from nature as birds, plants, and from metals. Architecture and design are the combined product of always mental and material extraction. And I think that this conversion is what I'm very interested in uh, launching in uh, our new center. I think that these are very difficult questions and I'm very happy to be part of the panel today because uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't attend the, 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 the symposium yesterday uh, because I was working, but I'm very glad uh, to observe the birth of our new design aspect or architecture uh, out, of sp out there of space. Uh, Giuliana Bruno, at the end of um, her um, intervention, when she's asking, are we human? She convincedly um, answer that we are not anymore. So it's an interesting challenge to start to rethink in the connection in between, you know, it's, it's so interesting, but you remember Noah when he put everything in an ark and transferred it into the new world. I'm always imagining, um, and this is part of the project that we came up in the convening, of investigating what should we put in the ark, but not as a database, actually as a physical archive that we can then transfer into the digital archive for us, the replicants, to inhabit uh, the future space. Um, the only thing I know is that at the end, humanity will be interplanetary. So I'm very happy to offer, to be at issue actually, has this incredible institution that is moving in between the past and the future because there's no way for me to think in the future without actually recollecting what we've done in the past. So the research center will find the time to do it because I don't think anyone else will have the time to do it. Thank you so much.
Beautiful. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Granville Carroll. And today I will be talking to you about Afrofuturism and spirituality. Hopefully, it doesn't continue to do that the entire time. I did. Okay. Let's see. No, I can't see anything. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Um, okay, let's see if I can do this. Happy the one with the issues. Of course. <laughs> I think so, yeah. All right, appreciate the patience. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Maybe. Okay, here we go. Grand Vaquero, I'll talk to you today about Afrofuturism and spirituality. Um, and for those who may not be familiar with Afrofuturism, it's a particular modality um, used to help redefine the black identity. And mostly it's done through science fiction, the imagination, technology. Um, and a little bit of the history of it is essentially thinking about black people that exist in the future. Um, back in the 90s, Mark Derry was realizing that black authors <coughs> in the sci-fi genre were um, not being represented properly. The characters that they developed were, I'm sorry, excuse me, black characters that were in sci-fi by other authors were being um, villainized or they just didn't exist in these books. And so Afrofuturism was a, coin, a, ter, a word coined by Mark Derry um, to help redefine that, that identity. And so for me as an artist, I use that myself along with the cosmos to start to question and ask what is representation, what is identity, um, and what does it look like to see the world through the lens of a black future, essentially. Um, and also asking the questions that a lot of us are asking, you know, where do we come from, the origin stories um, of humanity, um, and therefore, you know, the next steps in our evolution. So I'll be sharing three projects. This one here is titled Because the Sun Hath Looked Upon Me. It's a project that I developed because I was feeling limited by people's beliefs and perspectives about me as a black man. And so I wanted to examine what it meant to sort of free myself from these expectations. Um, to create images, blending together different forms of reality, different times and places, to then create my own um, sort of safeguards. Um, in this project, I use my upbringing in Christianity along with um, Buddhist ideas and African spiritual practices um, to sort of examine the world in different ways. And so the title, Because the Son Has Looked Upon Me, comes from the Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse six, um, where a paraphrase it says, do not look upon me because I'm black, because the sun hath looked upon me. Um, essentially stating that the sun has darkened their skin and that they're embarrassed by this 
essentially curse you can think of it. Um, and so I thought it was a real poetic way to think about um, this idea about who we are and where we're going. Um, this particular image is titled Interbeing, which is a Buddhist concept uh, developed by Thich Nhat Hanh. I know I probably did not say that correctly. Um, that all things have to, all things exist together. Um, there is no separation. Uh, and so I'm thinking about the blackness of the stars, the blackness of my skin, um, along with the landscape and, and how to sort of merge these ideas together. Um, as I had mentioned, I'm also thinking about ancient African practices, spiritual ideas. Uh, so this image titled Ordi um, is symbolizing this concept of Ashe, which in the Yoruba uh, cosmology is the vital force or energy that gives life and um, form to matter. And in Yoruba uh, culture, Ori, which is one of the words for head, um, is always emphasized. So in some of their artworks, their sculptures, you'll see this really, really large head. Um, and so I just wanted to visualize that for myself as well, thinking about their supreme deity, Olodumare, and how this idea of Ashe, this vital force, is emanating from their existence out into the universe um, for us to exist as we are as humans and for the potential of other life uh, beyond us as well. Um, and so this project uses, you know, this, this idea of syncretism to blend together philosophy, um, science, religion, spirituality, and then my own personal upbringing as well. Um, so this image is titled Selah, which is a word that's found in the Book of Psalms um, over 70 times or so. Um, and from my research, it shows that, you know, researchers and scholars are trying to understand what does this word mean, uh, but it sort of seems lost to time. Um, but that they believe uh, Selah is either to give praise or to have pause. Um, and so this image here, you know, pulling together sort of the darkness of night um, and the lightness of day to create this unreality um, is my sort of vision, my sacred space um, of Selah in which I can have pause and I can have rest and sanctuary from uh, the way that the world has projected blackness and uh, the African diaspora uh, throughout history. Um, so I'm going to speed up a little bit here as well. Um, so then Cosmotypes is another project that I developed uh, back in 2019. Uh, it's a series of tin types, uh, wet plate collodion. Uh, it's 19th century photographic process. Uh, and I was really curious, you know, I've been working with this previous project because it sometimes looked upon me using myself as sort of a conduit for the cosmic forces. Um, but I wanted to feel what it was like to not be bound by the body, not be bound by race or gender or these expectations, but just to sort of be a part of the cosmos. Um, and so I created this, this work using the most basic and foundational elements of photography, light and shadow, um, to create my own universes, to think about the um, explosions and uh, the coming together of matter in this sense, uh, the emptiness and the voids of space um, and how that aids in um, the condensing of matter as well. And so in this body of work, I'm questioning and asking, what are the origins of the universe? Where do we all come from? Um, who or what, you know, enacted this, this explosion of, of particles and matter to then be what we have today, planets and stars and um, asteroids and comets. And so all of my work seeks the answer, or not answer, seeks the question, um, but I don't, I'm never going to find an answer, and I'm okay with that, uh, because this type of work allows me to be curious about the world um, and to explore the boundaries of the universe um, and even outside of it, and thinking, you know, what exists beyond the Big Bang or be before time is it? Time itself has existed, um, and so then this newer project that I made, starting in 2020, uh, in the finite infinitely. I just started looking at some YouTube videos and I came across this, um, this theory, the uh, transcension hypothesis, so transcension theory, 
um, about the next step in humanity's evolution, um, talking about black holes and matter condensing and sort of puncturing the fabric of space-time, and that the reason why that we don't see aliens is not because they don't exist, but it's because they don't exist in outer space. Um, these scientists were thinking about and looking at uh, inner space, you know, these sort of portals, if you will, think about it in that sense. Um, so as an artist, I sort of took liberties with that concept and thought, well, instead of the inner space in the way that they're talking about it, what about the inner space of our minds? What about the psyche? Um, and what does that process of evolution do for us on an individual level and a collective level as well? Um, and so then in this work, I'm sort of envisioning again, thinking about the origins of the universe, uh, the primordial light that had to exist and come from the darkness and blackness of space um, that allows form and matter to be what it is. Um, returning back to Yoruba cosmology, um, connecting it to my upbringing in Christianity, and considering the relationship of origin stories across different cultures and time periods. Um, so in this image, first man, is my depiction of the first person who was born of the earth from the depths of the clay. And, um, and in Yoruba, in Christianity, the stories are very similar. And I found that just really, really interesting in terms of, um, you know, this more ancient African practice, but then how Christianity and other Abrahamic religions sort of came in and colonized them um, and forced them into different perspectives. And so then it makes me question and ask again, which one comes first? Which one is sort of a, a transformation of the other? Um, and where do I stand within that space as well? Um, wanting to observe and reflect upon the uh, creation of the universe um, and the destruction of it, because these are things that are one and the same. Um, and sort of coming back together and thinking about this philosophical principle eminence in which nothing is separate, um, everything exists on the same plane, there's no separation between object or subject, um, and really trying to create that space here in these images. Um, thinking about the cycles of life and death um, and embodying that, allowing the body to be a vessel or a channel in which then the cosmos are expressed and condensed and sort of moving in that cycle. Um, and then thinking about dreams as well. Um, my work, you know, is tapping into these questions uh, without the answer. Um, it's pushing the limits in terms of the universe, but then also going back inward, uh, thinking about how dreams are represented photographically and through um, space exploration. And this particular image I made because I woke up one morning and I felt so light that I could just be free and float. And I was like, why do I feel like I could fly? Like if I just wanted to jump up off of this couch, that I could just go into space and never come back. Um, and so then later it dawned on me, I, I, it came back to me that I had this dream that I just started sort of flapping my arms and I started flying and everyone around me was like looking in awe and I was like, yeah, this is, this is normal. It's okay. <laughs> it's not normal. Right. Um, so, but this, this feeling of lightness of, of being light and weightless, uh, it, it made me think, okay, can this be reality? Can there be a way in which then the body again can be free from itself, free from these confines, from these constructs, um, and just roam the universe in all of its glory. Um, and so I made this image sublimation, um, thinking about the transformation of solids into gas. Um, so these sort of scientific principles, but then emerging them with spirituality, thinking about the spirit leaving the body um, and where it will go next. Um, and then the last thing, oh, I was gonna pull it up here. Um, I just published a book with the Visual Studies Workshop um, called Dark Matter which is examining, it's an artist's book, uh, using poetry and uh, photography, looking at the origin stories, thinking about blackness as the foundation of the universe, um, and this sort of loose narrative of the beginnings of our world's creation, um, and then how we will move through it, uh, through these concepts of death and life and lightness and darkness, so thank you.
That was great. Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to set aside a little time before we open it up to Q&A for some audience conversation. And I want to begin uh, with a question that's in the abstract for the panel, but I wanted to specifically draw out something that Julie had said in her presentation. So broadly, we're all artists and or humanists uh, engaged with questions of outer space or space travel or uh, the cosmos. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think in different fields and in different ways, people in the arts and humanities often feel like they're on the periphery of the university or the, the sort of there's somehow a, a, a center of gravity that is often associated with the natural sciences, right? And so I know that one of the things that um, is great investment in here at Arizona State is trying to sort of rearrange or tinker with that the traditional power dynamic that has, you know, tended to govern how modern universities work. So what do you each think of as the sort of role of the arts and humanities? The way that Julia put it was to say that artists shining a light can open new perspectives. But I think there'd be a, there might be a variety of ways. And so why don't we, uh, maybe Lance, we'll start with you. And then I'd love to hear from others on this sort of like big picture question about the arts and the humanities with respect to the centers of gravity that are so powerful on university campuses? Well, that's a huge question that we could have an entire session on what is the role of the arts at the university and an in inquiry. Uh, you said arts tend to be relegated to the periphery. I'm a theater artist by education and training and nobody's going to keep me away from center stage. Um, I'll tell you that. Um, I, I think, all right, let me answer it this way. Um, people ask me all the time, how do you do what you do? How do you, how do you do this interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary work? How do you as an artist work, manage to figure out how to work with engineers and, and, and natural scientists and so on? And, and uh, I'm always confused a little bit by that question because it isn't so difficult um, uh, for a lot of reasons, but one of which is that um, artists and scientists and engineers are curious folks. Uh, we are passionately curious folks and we are used to asking questions and we are used to running into problems and we are used to figuring out how to solve them. Uh, all the time, an artist runs into problems with their work and figures out how to solve them. And so that's, like, I could go on and on about this, but that kind of curiosity, that, that, that tendency to ask questions and seek answers and, and solve problems, I think, is, uh, is, is one of the reasons why I, I'm not really worried about the kinds of distinctions that would relegate artists to to the periphery and science at the center because I, I we all need to be circulating. Yeah, anyway. I mean, I would agree with that. Um, the interdisciplinary connections of art with sciences, with math, um, I mean, you name it, it's all there. And I mean, honestly, it's kind, kind of sad because art usually gets put on the back burner, you know, less funding, things of that sort. It's not deemed as important, um, but it is, right? I mean, everything that we're looking at in this room was created by an artist of some sort. Um, so we've had to be curious to ask that question, seek a solution, find an answer, um, or at least, you know, collaborate in that sense as well. And so for me, you know, being an artist, it's important, especially as a photographer, uh, because visual media is it's there, right? Um, it's in your phone, social media. Uh, we're all being possessed by it uh, constantly. And so to understand the impact that the visual arts can have on a society or a culture, um, how it can direct change either negatively or positively, um, is something to consider as well. Um, and something that I talk to my students about a lot is to use your tools as an agent for positive change um, and not to uh, 
yeah, not, not to give yourself enough credit, uh, because the arts is powerful, and I think universities should take more responsibilities to respect them. I think it's, um, I think, I think artists are connection makers, um, like find slippages between disciplines, uh, find ways of connecting things that seem separate. Um, I think that maybe art and science are, are um, another kind of false dichotomy. And in my art and ecology class recently, we just, we had a school of sustainability, it's cross-listed with the school of sustainability and, and with artists. And we had a, the person who's leading the discussion created a Venn diagram between art and science. And in the brainstorming, it was just really hard we were actually finding it difficult to find things that were not, sorry, <laughs> thank you for the cue, to find things that were not in the um, center. Like it was kind of challenging when you really start to like look at it, you know, doing research, like everybody we're doing research, we're curious, we're asking questions, we're solving problems. Um, but I, I would say that the celebration of subjectivity is really core for, for me as a teacher and as a maker that kind of recognizing that people see things really radically different from one another and kind of lifting that up and making making that, put, pulling that into the center. Yeah. Did I see you wanting to get in, Elena? So I, I think that the world still needs arts and humanities because the body was the first object of the techne, of technology, and it will always be. Whatever technology we have invented, we have invented for the body, for the brain. So the circle always closes into the arts of the humanities because the body is the first object of the techne. Um, this idea of the replicant, to me, it's a very powerful one because um, the body still it moves. In, nowadays, we move in between the material and the immaterial, the culture and the digital culture, uh, the visible and the invisible. Even when we have experience, immersive experience, romantic experiences, it's all about the body. Um, I think that everything that is happening is like a game of a pool, you know? Like when you, when you play pool, when you play billiards, there are millions of possibilities that you hit the, the center of something, that you hit the target. The balls are in the pool and everything is there, right? But just the presence of the body is what is making that choice that is going to freeze a specific connection uh, between those balls to hit the target. So we forgot about the body because we move from, you know, a kind of coincidence between time and space because we invented a technology, a technology that actually altered this connection between time and space. And so I think that the role of arts and humanities is actually to reestablish or at least uh, to monitor that connection that we have had. Uh, you know, sometimes I'm showing, because I, I teach a course called Cinema and the Cities to architects and non-architects students and we see movies of Tarkovsky and they're all, you know, they don't understand that what is happening in a Tarkovsky movie is that the time of the movie and your time are actually the same time. There's no editing, there's no event, it's just about process. And I think that all of us, whatever we are doing, which is art, we are making, right? So we are the makers, even we do graphic design, art, architecture, whatever we do at different scales, 
we are making that connection to be possible and to overlap because accelerated time is actually acceleration is our problem so how can we represent that uh, person at the table in the conversation i think that the reason why i i, I want to launch this center is because i have the fear that we are missing that com conversation so representing for example architecture is still very necessary right whatever we do we are inside something we arrive on the world and the first things we see is a ceiling and when we die the last things we see is a ceiling in space that ceiling what is it gonna look like you know we still need the arts all of them minor art major art because we will always have a body which is the beginning of techne more dissonant note. Um, it's awesome to be in a room like this with a bunch of artists and humanists and, and talking about how, how important the arts are and thinking about humanist perspective, Picasso's quote, art is a lie that tells the truth, Nietzsche, we have art as so as not to die of the truth, etc., etc. But the, I, I, can, I can promise you, it, conferences of, of, uh, of science and engineering, they don't have conversations about, gee, why is science important? Uh, they know they're important. Um, there are, and, and one of the reasons we keep having these conversations, these wistful conversations to remind us why we matter, is, is that, is, is, is the, the proof that we are not as important is built into material structures at the university in terms of salary, in terms of resources. When I talk to my, um, colleagues in engineering and the sciences about the kind of grant opportunities there are for artists, it scares them. Um, uh, you know, you can, you can write long, detailed, uh, uh, inspiring grant proposals to get a couple thousand dollars, which is couch change to my colleagues in the sciences. Um, so I... <laughs> And I don't know what to do with that. Uh, I'm just sort of throwing that like a bomb into this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, th I think the question is, on the one hand, a, a long-standing sort of propensity for navel-gazing that humanists were already doing before <laughs> they were marginal. But on the other hand, that's why the word investment was intentionally in the question, right? Like, it's, it's, yeah. it's very much there. I think about, say, for instance, the size of grants that people in uh, you know, affiliated to the interplanetary initiative get, like if you gave a grant with that many zeros to a person in the arts or humanities, you would literally like undo capitalism. <laughs> like, <laughs> like we're so like the, the, the cost of this conference, like you give me $970 million and I could totally bring down the American government with the kinds of like technology. Yeah, I said it on camera. Hello, everybody. Uh, like. Like, we are really good at using our poorly resourced fields to change the world in interesting ways. So it's, to me, it's not a question about mar like the marginal position. It's a question of sort of like how we articulate that and how we work together to sort of get in the room at the right time in the right place. But in the broader culture, it's not like the arts aren't valued because artists are some of our most highly rewarded uh, 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 in individuals, um, uh, the the amount of money spent on Avatar: The Way of Water, for example, or or uh, you know Rihanna's upcoming tour, or uh, th things like that. It's like it's not that artists aren't valued in different ways, but right. at the university in particular. So just uh, sort of wanted to ask one more question before we open it up. Uh, so I've had the benefit of going to several other panels that have been connected to space and outer space and, and, and sort of cosmic energies questions, which are, are you know, run throughout this conference um, with the theme that we have. Um, there was a, a really interesting panel earlier on uh, Octavia Butler's work. There was a panel immediately before lunch on, on religion in outer space. So one of the things that keeps cropping up, and this came up in several of your presentations, are questions of time. And I think one of the places where I hear my colleagues in the arts and humanities 
thinking in specific ways related to space and space exploration is this question of inevitability, right? That there's some sort of destiny in the stars or that it's, it's written in, so, so there's sort of an eschatological expectation that humans will transcend their earthly limits. That's something that keeps coming up in sort of different contexts. It's out there in the sort of Elon Musk discourse. It's in certain strains of Afrofuturism, right? So that, that's out there. What, what do you each make of that question of temporality as something that is to be engineered, to be changed, trajectories that maybe are to be followed? How, how do you think about those questions in your work in, in whatever ways make sense to you? Well, I'll say for time, kind of, you know, I think Elena had touched upon it. It's, I think of time as a circle um, that is continuously expanding and contracting. Um, and it just keeps, like a fractal, right? It just keeps turning upon itself over and over and over again. Um, of course, you know, we can sit here and say, oh, okay, time's a human construct and we use it to, you know, divide up our days, our nights, and our work schedules and all these things, which is true. But even without the human-centric perspective there, you know, time still has to exist in some sort of capacity. Um, and so, like, my project in the finite infinitely sort of touches upon that, that aspect, especially, like, just in the title itself, right? How can you both be finite and infinite? Um, but that's for me, you know, even though it's sort of um, an ironic statement uh, or they're, they're contradicting each other, um, that that is just the true nature of time. It both is and it both isn't. Um, it is because we sit here and observe it um, and it isn't, you know, outside or wherever, you know, at the beginnings of the universe or, or you know, whatever point of perspective you want to be at. Um, and so yeah, I don't know, it's, it's a strange concept to think about. Um, and we're gonna be forever locked into it, you know, as we age and we die. Um, but that's another question about time that I have is, after physical death, is there something thereafter that allows us to continue experiencing time? Um, none of us can say, right, because we're all alive. Um, <laughs> but. Yeah, I don't know. It's those type of questions that keep me spinning around in that circle and thinking of time as, you know, this contracting and, you know, expanding and, and collapsing upon itself constantly. Um, yeah, I'm thinking a lot, I guess I'm thinking a lot in my work about the past and the present. And um, I'm really happy to be grounded like uh, it's kind of funny in a context of space artifacts and my work that's about artifacts in the, you know burning through the atmosphere and things I'm I'm very pleased to be on earth um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I feel really happy to be grounded here um, you know I am um, ambivalent deeply ambivalent about the um, the trajectory uh, that you were, I think, referencing. Um, in terms of time with the Ground Truth Project, you know, we've worked on that for many years, and one of the subtexts of that project has to do with the way that the Earth's atmosphere has changed from the time that those Ground Truth markers were made in 1968 to when there were maybe two objects you know, or orbiting to the current situation, which, uh, you know, documented there are these incredibly intricate webs of trajectories. And I worked with an astrodynamist on a panel for uh, a couple years ago, whose job it was to help us, um, his job was to help visualize and help us be able to leave Earth without not running into some of the stuff that we've jet that we've got orbiting so it's really he had this beautiful animation beautiful and disturbing animation of the earth like with all the bees in her bonnet um you know it's just like kind of like earth saturn's ring except it was distributed over the entire sphere you know these um all these artifacts 
Um, so I'm interested in, you know, my colleague, you know, my, my peer, aspirational peer, Trevor Packland's work um, that, that really kind of asks questions about the ways that we're leaving these artifacts in our atmosphere, you know, that will be understood by, um, by future generations or alien um, life forms um, and, you know, what that means. So, um, I'm sorry, but I'm going to refer to architects. Uh, the question of time is always in relation to space for us, because in fact, I think that as movie makers, we frame the stories of people in rooms so that we retain time. We put the time in brackets. Um, so the issue of space is very much uh, important for us, you know, even in a conversation, the fact that the time, you know, when you are at, at dinner, your first date or something important, time feels like quick or times feel very slow depending on that connection in between the two humans, but as well what we call the intuition of space which is the background that is here. So you perceive myself because of this and I perceive you because of that. Um, intuition of space is what is making the time of a room feeling longer, shorter. And so in a sense, um, we like to think about what happens when you know you are having, you are designing those spaces that will be very reduced in principle out of, of space um, for allowing what kind of relations, what kind of relational um, relation will space develop in, and what kind of time would the restriction, the reduction of space, um, you know, um, create in a sense. In sp built space, uh, in architecture, I like to say, um, it's very important for us how we develop um, the relations among people because they become mnemonic, they become memories. We always have a memory of something because the, the space was really affecting. So we have a perception of that time because the space, like of our grandmother, wardrobe was really affecting the experience of our grandma. Space depends on the five senses. Time depends on the five senses. And it's fantastic how the brain works when it connects the two, time and space. So the question to me, thinking, you know, how we transfer that relation between time and space, outer space, it's precisely related to what, what is this intuition of space going to look like? And uh, how that substance of the material relations between us is going to change and how that is going to affect uh, the time. Because anyway, we will always, always, and I'm sorry I have been uh, experiencing even the dreamscape here or any immersive environment, we will always use the surface of something as the medium for our interrelations, therefore experiencing time in that space. So I can't divide time from space. That's why for us it was very difficult during COVID to teach on Zoom because it became all, like for a replicant, all about optical experiences rather than smell, experiences, touch, taste, you know, all of this. And so uh, there is an important issue um, to think about even when we will be transferring ourselves between here and Psyche, for example, the satellite, and we will be inside again for five years. Uh, 
how are we going to experience that space? How are we going to project uh, that intuitional space? And if we are alone, how can we make space and time be a pleasant experience? Great. So um, we have time for a little bit of question and uh, comment from the audience. So I invite uh, you to wait for Amanda to come around if you'd like to, to chat with the panel. Thank you each of you for your tremendous artistry and how you've been able to reshape that for this audience. Thank you. Um, I'm curious since for human history, there have been curiosities about the cosmological um, and only in the past generation or two has there been the possibility of moving in extraterrestrial ways. Um, how much of what you are imagining do you think will take place off of the planet? What, what is the point of the work to imagine a space that is interplanetary or is the point of the work to imagine a space from the terrestrial um, toward a future that may or may not happen? I'm just curious because of the kinds of things people seem to be trying to escape through some of these imaginal spaces of the interplanetary. Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand the distinction that you're making. Could you elaborate? Well, since yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm just thinking about how so many uh, imaginal spaces through time have been made looking up at the stars, right? Um, religious meanderings, um, scientific meanderings, various categories where you can put these um, spaces of thought. And it's lovely to see the ways that you bring artistic imagination to those uh, directions. I'm just curious how much in realistic space of the present and future you think that the things that you're doing are creating a space for being off of the planet or creating a space for imagining things that are off of the planet. Since only in the past generation have a handful of people left uh, the planet. I'll, I'll just speak for myself and my own experience working with the uh, uh, ASU's interplanetary initiative. Uh, we don't put a lot of distinction between imagining and building um, because the way you start building is by imagining. One of the reasons I was really uh, excited to be a part of this panel and and poke around at this at this conference on uh, and and one of the reasons that that MJ and I are putting together this uh, sacred space project is uh, we're looking for new stories for better stories than the ones we have uh, because the ones we have are familiar and they don't have good endings. And um, so in order to build positive human space futures, we got to imagine the stories of what it is we want to build and how to build that. So I, I, I guess I, I, I wouldn't draw such a clean distinction between imagining and making. I guess I'm thinking about, um, I think that my, both of the projects that I showed are really about having your feet firmly on the ground. And um, the Ground Truth Project, I think I am aiming to cultivate a kind of sense of vulnerability uh, that's very much of the body. Um, and uh, by having this kind of pressing two-thirds composition of the vertical um, the vertical skies that are full though in you know 
this visualizing what's invisible and the kind of weight of that, just visual weight of that on the ground. Um, yeah, and then I think with the other piece, the brand new project that I'm just coming into understanding, um, the Echoes of the Passage, I'm thinking about being, being a human that kind of really accesses these artifacts that are charged from an experience that's remote, from an experience that's rare. Um, so I guess that's my perspective on your question. Thank you. Um, awesome. So for us, the architect, um, your question is a very complicated one because we tend to build through layers and different faces. So imagination is a key word for us, but uh, imagination in faces. Um, you know, when we look at thinking, you know, how to build out there, we are less visionary, we are actually very practical and we know that architecture is a very relational matter because it does promote uh, the agency of uh, human subjectivity. But in this case we have a problem. Uh, we have actually, we need engineer because we need to think in uh, robots. We won't be there building as we always been doing. We will send first robots or inflatable structures and things that will build for us. So what is very interesting in this moment for our profession is that we always been collaborating with the engineer and everyone because uh, it's uh, very complex to put something like this by ourselves. But for the outer space, our imagination now requires really to think as robots. And so it's less nice, our imagination is less like a, a nice picture. It's actually like a system, the one that we are imaging. What's the system that is sending out there on a rocket some inflatable and a system of a bunch of little animals, robots, they are 3D printing the skin for protecting us from radiation and how we land then carefully because everyone that is landing might destroy a project that is already happening like a few meters on the other side. So for us this imagination that Lance is referring is about how we build um, and that idea of envisioning the future starting from the start is something that we will we already have it. So for us it's a step that we will just push forward because it's already existing so we have to make sure that we understand that building a window over there is not about looking at the stars that we are used to look at them here. Without atmosphere things are less nicer. What about, you know, a nice sunset here in Arizona? Uh, what about meditation without a sunrise? Because everything there is abrupt. And so I like to think that this imagination is about how we build that. But we have a lot that we can test uh, already. So how do we make sure that we understand what we have and then we push it forward in the future? We have time for one quick question. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the. So, <clears throat> I'm curious about the. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm bad with names. The pictures with the satellite tracks and the, the geo locations. I'm curious what uh, land jurisdiction those are in. Is that like federal land or is that like a military land that you have to specially access? And then a really quick related question is there's a lot of conversation in, in environmental ethics about wilderness space is wilderness and wilderness and space conservation in relation to like extraction and i'm just curious your interplanetary initiative is that something that that's something i'm interested in i've explored a little bit oh there's a lot more than me and if that's something coming up so two really quick interrelated questions if you have time yeah um so there the designations it's it, it's a 
it's a small area, it's a 16 square mile grid, but the designations are all over the place. Some of them are on tribal land, some of them are on people's farms, some of them are in the middle of suburbs, some of them are right by the highway. Um, yeah, and uh, it was a secret CIA project. Um, we, uh, and so the, lands, the land parcels were um, uh, uh, borrowed essentially um, piece by piece. Uh, and with a, uh, a story around what they were doing that wasn't what they were doing. Yeah, but they're highly visible. Visi they're not like, they're very visible. They're, um, they're not like preserved. They're not marked in any special way. Um, yeah, they're just eroding. Okay. <laughs> Oh, and uh, your question about the Interplanetary Initiative and its relation to uh, land and rights and stuff like that, that that's an ongoing conversation that's really lively. Um, but it's all based on old, old treaties, the Outer Space Treaty, the uh, Moon Treaty, and, and Artemis Accords, uh, but it's an active area of conversation. Yeah, and then I just wanted to touch upon the idea of the wilderness of the space of space um, and so I think about like the darkness of space the expanse of it these voids um, as essentially being like these woods I guess you can think of a forest right um, trees and the roots and the whole network there that's that's present um, and thinking about like dark matter and dark energy and these these things that are sort of foundational for you know, galaxies and then planets and, and things to exist like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting to think about darkness and space as being this foundation of everything that we are and everything that we will be, um, and sort of the reflection of that on our present world. Um, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate you coming and sharing about the interesting work you're each doing. Uh, and I'm very grateful for the support of the Interplanetary Initiative in helping make uh, the technology side of this conference click. So uh, a round of applause for our panelists, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.